In May of 2009, 48-year-old Rodrigo Rosenberg was at the peak of his career as one of Guatemala's most prominent lawyers. Tall, handsome, and charismatic, Rodrigo had law degrees from both Cambridge University and Harvard University, and he was the co-founder of a very successful corporate law office in Guatemala City, the country's capital. And while it was obvious that Rodrigo had worked very hard for all of the nice things he had, like his luxury Mercedes-Benz car, in reality, he didn't really have to work for a living. Rodrigo had been born into privilege. There was wealth on both sides of his family, his mother had brought a large inheritance to her marriage, and his father had built a massive business empire that included a chain of movie cinemas. When Rodrigo stepped out of his office building in downtown Guatemala City to meet a client for lunch at one of the upscale restaurants tucked away in the capital's maze of boutiques and little markets, he looked exactly like what he was. A member, like his parents before him, of the Guatemalan oligarchy, a small group of rich, upper-class conservative Guatemalans who had connections and influence in government and business. He always wore a dark, perfectly tailored suit, an immaculate white shirt, and a pale blue tie, an expensive uniform that set off his dark features and the ring of black hair cut short around the crown of his bald head. And when Rodrigo talked to his client in one of those hacienda-style eateries with red clay tiled roofs and cool stucco interiors that he especially favored, it wouldn't be long before his client, like all of Rodrigo's clients, realized that it wasn't just the money or influence that drove Rodrigo. Like his friends and associates like to say, Rodrigo had a strong sense of purpose as well as ambition, and a very strong sense of right and wrong. He had chosen a career in law because he liked the clarity of the law. If it was practiced fairly, he felt like it was the best way of settling disagreements and disputes. But the thing that really made Rodrigo stand out in this Central American country of 16 million people was not just his brilliance and his drive, it was the fact that he had a reputation for absolute honesty. Because Guatemala was a country best known in the world for its incredible levels of corruption and violence. Even though 36 years of civil war between authoritarian rulers and leftist guerrillas had ended back in 1994, that conflict had left more than 200,000 people, many of them civilians, dead, and another 45,000 people, quote, disappeared, which meant either killed or kidnapped, mostly the work of government forces or right-wing paramilitary groups. But after the 1994 peace agreement was signed, most of the people in Guatemala who had committed the murders and rapes and other widespread human rights violations that took place during the Civil War were never prosecuted or called to account for their crimes. Instead, in the post-Civil War Guatemala, these should-be war criminals simply turned to new careers, such as participating in organized crime, becoming assassins for hire, or getting in on the very lucrative Central and South American drug trade. And 15 years later, even though Guatemala had a democratically elected civilian president who had promised to root out crime and government corruption, these criminals and their criminal networks had still been able to reach their tentacles into almost every government and law enforcement agency, and nearly half the country wasn't under any government control at all. By 2009, Guatemala had the third highest murder rate of any country in the world, averaging more than 123 homicides every week, and 97% of those murders went unsolved. And the few cases that did go to trial often ended with the alleged killers going free after judges or prosecutors or witnesses were bribed, threatened, or even murdered. So in this sea of corruption, where everyone with power seemed to have dirt on their hands, Rodrigo stood out for his willingness to shamelessly call out criminal behavior wherever he saw it. So to anyone who knew Rodrigo, it didn't come as any surprise when he wasn't just horrified when one of his very own clients was assassinated in broad daylight. He was absolutely furious, especially since this particular client, Musa Khalil, had a reputation for being a very ethical businessman who treated his workers fairly. Since arriving in Guatemala from Lebanon when he was just a young man, 76-year-old Musa had worked his way up from poverty to become a successful coffee producer and textile manufacturer. Although Rodrigo was not personally close to Musa, 
Rodrigo admired and respected the older man because the man refused to steal from the state or make payoffs to get favorable deals on his coffee or manufacturing companies. Musa was a straight shooter, just like Rodrigo. The assassination took place in Guatemala City on April 14, 2009, as Musa and his 37-year-old daughter Marjorie were waiting in their car at a traffic light while on their way to lunch. According to eyewitnesses, a car pulled up quickly behind them, and a man hopped out and approached the front passenger seat of the Khalil's car where Musa was sitting. Musa and his daughter likely assumed that this man just wanted to ask them a question, but as soon as this man reached their car window, he pulled out a 9mm pistol and he fired 9 shots into Musa's head and torso. By the time the police arrived, the gunman had fled the scene on the back of a motorcycle driven by an accomplice, and Musa, along with his daughter, were both dead. It would turn out one of those nine bullets that were fired at Musa had passed right through his body and struck and killed his daughter. She was not the intended target, she was just collateral damage. On the day of the murders, right after Rodrigo had found out about them, he contacted his 24-year-old son Eduardo, who was also a lawyer at Rodrigo's law firm, and told him to meet him at the crime scene. When Eduardo arrived, he found his father pacing back and forth in front of the yellow crime scene tape, demanding answers from the police who had converged on the scene along with medical personnel. Turning to his approaching son, Rodrigo swept his arms out to either side in a gesture of helplessness and frustration that took in the whole chaotic scene in front of them. There was also an expression of shock and sadness on his father's face that Eduardo didn't see very often. You couldn't live in Guatemala without feeling like violence, even murder, was just business as usual. But Eduardo also understood that there was something different about this crime, something that made it stand out, especially to members of the city's wealthy upper class. Because, like them, Musa and his whole family were people with power and influence. They had personal ties with people inside the administration of Guatemala's president, Alvaro Colom. If Musa could be gunned down in cold blood in the middle of the day, others among the Guatemalan elite worried that the same thing could happen to them too. Before leaving the crime scene, Rodrigo told his son in a bitter voice that the police, like always, would probably never find and prosecute the people who killed Musa and Marjorie. And even if they did, they'd never be able to touch whoever it was that had organized the assassination in the first place. It didn't take long for Rodrigo's prediction to come true. Even though thousands of people turned out for the funeral service of Musa and his daughter, including President Colomb's powerful private secretary, police made absolutely no progress on tracking down the killers, and it wasn't long before the murders just seemed like all the others in Guatemala, just numbers on a stat sheet. Except this time, Rodrigo had had enough. Musa had been a good man and his innocent daughter, Marjorie, had left behind a husband and two children. And so if the police were not going to catch their killers, then Rodrigo would. Rodrigo told his son that one way or another, he was going to get to the bottom of this and figure out exactly who did it and why. But almost as soon as he got started asking questions, Rodrigo noticed that even by Guatemalan standards, the police seemed to have gathered virtually no information outside of taking the obligatory statements from witnesses who saw the assassination and asking Musa's family if he had had any business or money troubles. And as Rodrigo began calling some of his contacts within the government about the police investigation, he began to wonder whether there was an active attempt going on inside President Colomb's circle of advisors to cover up some connection that the government itself might have to the assassination. So just a few days after Musa's funeral, Rodrigo turned to another one of his clients, a man named Luis Mendizabal, who was also a close friend of Rodrigo's. After calling Luis to arrange a visit, Rodrigo slipped out of his law office and drove to the exclusive men's clothing store that Luis owned in one of the capital's most fashionable districts. But the fitting and sale of handmade suits was just part of the business that Luis operated out of that storefront. To those who knew him well, they knew that Luis's real skill was in the collection of secrets and information. With his flowing white hair and trim mustache, and his easy banter about his family and his grandchildren, Luis did not look the part of a spy. 
But as he measured and cut fabric and chatted with a wealthy clientele that included criminals, businessmen, military, police, and government bureaucrats, Luis gathered huge amounts of insider intel on what was going on in their country. And so if there was anyone who could help Rodrigo find out who killed Musa and Marjorie, it was Luis. Rodrigo's hunch paid off. Before long, Luis had come up with a possible lead in the Musa murder case. A few months before the assassination, at the very beginning of 2009, Musa had been nominated to serve on the board of directors for two institutions that both had ties to something called the Rural Development Bank, or the Ban Rural. The Ban Rural was the major funding source for the president's popular social programs, and these two institutions that had invited Musa to join them were engaged in a power struggle over which one of them would control the bank. But since rumors of sketchy financial dealings were already swirling around Ban Rural, when Musa was offered these two board positions, Rodrigo had actually advised him not to accept either of them. However, Rodrigo had no idea what Musa's final decision had been. Luis suspected that Musa, as he began to do his own research on these two institutions, had uncovered that one or both of them were engaged in financial mismanagement. More conversations with Musa's family seemed to confirm this theory. One of Musa's surviving daughters told Rodrigo that her father had received threatening letters from officials on the two boards and that Musa had apparently written back to them saying, you can't tell me what to do and I will protect myself from my enemies. During the three weeks that followed Musa's assassination, Eduardo saw less and less of his father, who was spending more and more of his time on his own private investigation into these murders. It seemed to everyone who knew Rodrigo that his outrage over the murders had turned into an unhealthy obsession. Rodrigo basically stopped going in to the law office or returning calls to his regular clients and instead just stayed home in his apartment where he lived alone to pore over his notes on the murders. And when Eduardo did meet his father for lunch or for dinner, Rodrigo barely touched his food and all he wanted to talk about was his theory that Musa had somehow become the target of a conspiracy at the highest levels of government. His father, who had been an avid cyclist, had completely stopped going on his morning bike rides. He'd lost weight, his perfectly tailored suits hung on him just loosely enough that he looked disheveled, and his eyes never stopped moving, constantly checking his phone for calls and messages, and showing no interest at all about how things were going back at the office. Eduardo knew that both his parents were still struggling after having separated the year before. Rodrigo's own father had abandoned his family when Rodrigo was very young, and Rodrigo had never forgiven him, even refusing to accept the inheritance his father had left for him. So after Rodrigo's separation, when his estranged wife moved to neighboring Mexico with their four children, Rodrigo was crushed. He felt like he had abandoned his own family. Looking at his father now, Eduardo worried that any progress his father might have made in adjusting to his new situation and moving on with his personal life was now being completely consumed by this private murder investigation. It was obvious to Eduardo that this investigation had become more than just finding the killers. It was about trying to actually stop corruption at the heart of Guatemala's politics. And in early May of that year, Rodrigo suddenly knew, without a doubt, that all that digging and all the documents he was putting together about corruption at Ban Rural, all the names and dates of meetings, the involvement of President Colom and his wife, all of it was finally getting him closer to the people who had murdered his client. For weeks, he'd had the feeling that he was being followed, that everywhere he went outside of his apartment, someone was watching him. But now he had proof. Because now, Rodrigo, like Musa, had started receiving threats. Except his threats were phone calls, not letters. The first call came on May 5th. It only lasted long enough for the caller to tell Rodrigo to stop his investigation into the murders. After that, the calls came once a day with the same message. And even though Rodrigo couldn't recognize the deliberately distorted voice on the other end of the line, he started to suspect that the threats were coming directly from within President Colom's inner circle, from Colom's private secretary himself, 
a man named Gustavo Alejos, who actually had an office directly across from the apartment where Rodrigo lived. Not only was Gustavo an influential advisor to the president, his brother was the head of the Guatemalan Congress. After these threatening calls started coming in, Rodrigo, who was far more excited at this development than afraid, called his spy friend Luis to tell him about how he thought Gustavo Alejos was the caller. Rodrigo also asked Luis to write down the unknown telephone number that belonged to this threatening caller. Even though he didn't say it explicitly, it was clear to Luis that he was being told to take this number down in case something happened to Rodrigo. After the two friends hung up, Luis felt very concerned. He felt like Rodrigo was aware of the danger he was in, but wasn't fully appreciating it. And so on May 8th, after Rodrigo met Luis at his clothing shop, Luis quickly pulled his friend into a back room, and once the door was shut and they were alone, Luis told Rodrigo in a hushed tone that not only should he stop his investigation into the murders, but that he should flee Guatemala altogether. Clearly, his life was in danger given the threatening phone calls he was getting, but Rodrigo said he could not stop now. He knew he was close to getting the name of Musa's killer and solid proof that the government had been involved in the assassination. He also told Luis, as a way of reassuring him, that once he had all the evidence he needed, he was not about to go to the Guatemalan police, who very well could have even played a role in the murders. Instead, he planned to present his findings to the powerful and high-profile International Criminal Court that is seated in The Hague in the Netherlands. The ICC is known around the world for trying cases that involve genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression and for trying criminals like the ones in Guatemala who all received immunity from the Guatemalan government at the end of the Guatemalan Civil War. By going directly to The Hague, Rodrigo would finally be taking action against a system of government corruption that had, in the words of one of his friends, been eating at his guts for years. However, before he could go any further with this case, Rodrigo told Luis, as they sat in the back of Luis's shop, that there was one very specific thing that Rodrigo still had to do. And in order to do it, he needed Luis's help. It was a favor. And it was an insurance policy that no matter what happened in any court of law, the information that Rodrigo had uncovered was guaranteed to become public knowledge. Reluctantly, Luis agreed. And after discussing the details, they arranged to meet again the next day. As Rodrigo left the store, Luis had a bad feeling. He was certain that whatever the outcome of Rodrigo's plan, it was sure to bring a lot of pain to his family and to his friends. Two days later, on Sunday, May 10th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, Rodrigo stepped into one of the bedrooms of his trendy luxury apartment in the Zona 1 neighborhood of Guatemala City. Glancing out the window, he could see the faint outlines of the mountains that ringed the capital. But his mind was on other things. Luis had been as good as his word and had helped Rodrigo put together the final pieces of the case that he had been building one fact at a time against the Guatemalan government. His bodyguard, who also served as his driver, had also been willing to help, running a couple of errands the week before that Rodrigo had not been able to see to himself, including taking Rodrigo's bike in for a tune-up. It had been more than a month since Rodrigo had done any serious cycling, but the night before, he'd made up his mind that this morning, he was going to go out and go for a ride, even if it was just a short one. He was lucky with the day's weather. May was one of Guatemala's rainiest months, but that morning was dry and the sun was breaking through the clouds. Rodrigo pulled on his navy blue bike shorts and blue short sleeve top and laced up his white sneakers. Leaving his bedroom, he checked the gold watch on his left wrist and then walked toward the front door, pausing long enough to grab the red and white mountain bike that was leaning against the wall in the front hallway. He wheeled his bike to the elevator, and a minute later, he was pushing the bike out of the apartment complex onto the sidewalk that led to the main street that ran left to right in front of the building. Once Rodrigo made it to the edge of this main road, he looked both ways along the road to see if any cars were coming, and as he did that, the sun broke through and suddenly lit up the grass and trees along either side of the street. Just before getting on his bike, Rodrigo checked to make sure his iPod was queued up to his favorite band, Santana. He hit play, and then he pushed his bike off the curb into the road, he turned right, then hopped on his bike, and began pedaling down the street. 
After only a few hundred yards, Rodrigo turned right again off of the main road onto a service road. The sun reflected off the windows of a brown and white high-rise apartment just ahead of him on the left. Minutes later, Rodrigo noticed a man running across the street in front of him from the left to the right, and at first, Rodrigo thought it was a jogger. But then he noticed this man was wearing jeans and a dark jacket with a high collar. The running man, after he crossed the street and was on the right side, he slowed and then looked intently at Rodrigo. And for a second, their eyes met. And then this man with the jeans and the jacket began running at full speed towards Rodrigo. Okay, back to the story. Before Rodrigo could do anything except make a final erratic swerve to the right that took his bike right to the edge of the curb, the man had closed the distance between them, reached into the waistband of his jeans, and pulled out a gun. Rodrigo felt the thud of the first three bullets and heard the loud crack of each shot. His bike clattered to the pavement as he fell backward over the curb until he was half laying in the grassy median. By the time the second two bullets shattered Rodrigo's jaw and forehead, Rodrigo was dead. A few seconds later, nearby residents heard the sound of a car gunning its engine and roaring off into the distance. Within minutes, those same residents of the Zona 1 neighborhood were on their phones making frantic calls to 911 to report the sound of gunfire. Police were on the scene almost immediately. On his way to Rodrigo's apartment, Rodrigo's bodyguard heard the sirens and saw the police cars that were blocking the service road near his employer's apartment. He slowed down, and as police started setting up a perimeter, he thought he caught a glimpse of a red and white bike on the pavement. He parked his car at the top of the service road, and as he jumped out and headed towards the knot of police and emergency personnel, he pulled out his phone and called Rodrigo's son, Eduardo. Because by now, the bodyguard could clearly see that the body sprawled on the edge of the service road near that red and white bike belonged to his employer. Rodrigo's bodyguard had known what Rodrigo was working on. He'd even run some errands that he'd suspected were related to the case his boss was investigating. He'd warned Rodrigo to be careful. He wished now that he had insisted on staying over last night and accompanying Rodrigo on this bike ride. A few minutes later, Eduardo, as well as his father's friend, Luis, showed up at the crime scene. Ashen-faced, Eduardo identified himself as Rodrigo's son. But before he and Luis had time to process what they were seeing, they were both approached by Guatemala police officers who were eager to start gathering information about what had happened. Right as the two men stepped back away from the carnage in front of them, Eduardo noticed his father was wearing a wedding ring on his finger again. And instantly when he saw that, Eduardo recalled a secret his father had told him right around the time Musa and Marjorie had been killed. And as he thought of the secret, Eduardo felt an unexpected rush of grief come over him, and his eyes started to fill with tears. He felt so sorry for his father and he just hoped that the police would be able to find his killer and bring them to justice. But before the police could really even begin their investigation, something happened that would push the Guatemalan government to the edge of total collapse. On May 12th, two days after Rodrigo's murder, hundreds of people crowded into a church to attend Rodrigo's funeral service. The pews were filled wall to wall with his family, friends, clients, government officials, business leaders, and the fashionably dressed members of the capital's wealthy oligarchy. Right after Eduardo had delivered his father's eulogy, Rodrigo's friend, Luis, stepped forward and addressed the mourners who looked like a who's who of the Guatemalan elite. Taking a deep breath, Luis said to the crowd that he knew they were all asking themselves the same question. Why would anyone want to kill Rodrigo Rosenberg? Then, Luis held up his hand, showing the crowd a case that contained a DVD. This, he said, contained the answer to that question. Once the surprised and excited murmurs quieted down, Luis went on to say that Rodrigo had left instructions that if he was murdered, then Luis should go public with the 18-minute long video that he now held in his hand. Luis, who said that he himself had only seen the video after his friend's death, invited anyone in the crowd interested to take a copy of the DVD with them when they left. 
One of the mourners who took Luis up on that offer was a government minister who immediately called President Colom's personal secretary, Gustavo Alejos, to tell him what had just happened. A few minutes later, the minister slipped out of the church and drove straight to the National Palace in the center of Guatemala City, where President Colom lived with his wife. As President Colom, along with his vice president and closest advisors, gathered in the president's office, an aide slipped the disc into the president's computer and then hit play. A second later, they were all staring at an image of Rodrigo sitting alone behind a table with a blue screen behind him. He was wearing his usual navy blue suit, pressed white shirt, light blue tie, and wedding ring. In front of him was a microphone. There was nothing professional or polished about the production of the video that filled the computer screen in front of the president and his aides. And for some reason, that made the message that Rodrigo delivered even more believable and chilling. After stating his name for the record, Rodrigo wasted no time dropping the bombshell that would soon be heard all over the world as the 18 minute long video was uploaded to YouTube where it would go viral under the simple title, YouTube Murder. On the video, Rodrigo very calmly states, if you are seeing or hearing this message, it means that I've been murdered by President Alvaro Colom with the help of his personal secretary, Gustavo Alejos. Rodrigo would also blame the president, his wife, and Gustavo Alejos for the assassination of Musa Khalil and his daughter. Rodrigo stated that they were killed because Musa's involvement with the Rural Development Bank, Ban Rural, had put him in a position to reveal the president and first lady's abuse and misappropriation of Ban Rural funds. Rodrigo said the president's motive for killing him, Rodrigo, was because Rodrigo had direct knowledge of the conspiracy to kill Musa and that Rodrigo also had proof that the president and first lady were using Ban Rural to embezzle and launder millions of dollars. Rodrigo warned Guatemalans against believing the smear campaign and cover-ups that would greet these accusations, ending with a plea to all Guatemalans that it was time for massive government reform. And the first step was to get rid of President Colom and replace him with the vice president, who was not a thief or assassin, and whose duty it would be to bring the rule of law back to Guatemala. Rodrigo's video would have a massive ripple effect, Within hours of its upload to YouTube, Guatemala was plunged into a sudden and totally unexpected political crisis. The people of Guatemala, for the most part, believed what Rodrigo was saying. Even some of the president's own advisors wondered if the accusations were true. The president's initial reaction was not to respond to the accusations himself, but rather to send two of his aides out to publicly dismiss the video as a fake. However, this would have the opposite effect. And so that night, under lots of mounting pressure, President Colom went on national TV to deny the accusations himself. However, he looked more scared and nervous than convincing. Meanwhile, so many people from all over the world were watching this video that YouTube servers started to crash and protesters wearing white shirts to symbolize their demand for a clean government started to flood the streets of Guatemala's capital city. Alvaro Colom knew before the end of that Tuesday, May 12th, that his presidency was hanging on by just a thread. So when protesters and the Guatemalan elite demanded that a United Nations-backed agency, rather than the Guatemalan police, handle the investigation into Rodrigo's death, the president knew he had to agree. By the next morning, May 13th, the whole investigation was in the hands of an international commission called the CICIG. This organization had been created by the United Nations in 2007 to investigate specific cases of systemic violence and corruption. And under the direction of Spanish judge Carlos Castrosana, who took up residence in Guatemala City, an international group of investigators did what Guatemalan police either couldn't do or wouldn't do. They began relentlessly drilling down into who was behind the assassination of Rodrigo Rosenberg. The first break in the case happened almost immediately. Whoever had organized the hit on Rodrigo had chosen one of the most heavily videotaped neighborhoods in Guatemala. While investigators couldn't find a reliable eyewitness to the crime, footage gathered from dozens of security cameras near Rodrigo's apartment had captured almost the entire assassination on camera. 
Almost immediately after getting onto his bicycle at 8.05 a.m., Rodrigo was followed by a black late model Mazda. Security cameras also caught clear enough images of that black getaway car that investigators were eventually able to track down the car and then its owner. And when they examined the car owner's phone records and location data, investigators were able to place him and several calls he made on the day of the murder at or near the crime scene. Investigators immediately set up a wiretap operation on the car owner, and for the next four months, they listened in on his conversations, and quickly, they discovered that he was part of a criminal gang made up of 10 men, most of them former national police officers. Meanwhile, using the CICIG powers, Judge Castrosana started identifying and arresting corrupt members of the Guatemalan government, and as Rodrigo had predicted in his 18-minute video, Investigators were up against a disinformation campaign organized by the president or his top advisors aimed at interfering with the investigation and smearing the vice president, the man Rodrigo had tapped as Colomb's successor. But it wasn't until September, four months after Rodrigo was killed, that Judge Castrosana got the breakthrough he was looking for. After a massive raid on 10 different locations throughout Guatemala, investigators arrested all 10 members of the criminal gang whose phones investigators had been tapping. Once in custody, it didn't take long for members of this gang to start giving up information in exchange for lighter sentences. And so quickly, investigators were able to start to piece together how the murder was carried out, except they were missing a crucial piece of information. The 10-person gang clearly didn't know Rodrigo. They were just following orders to have him killed. But what the investigators couldn't figure out was who gave them that order? Who was the person behind the scenes making this assassination happen? Judge Castrosana and his team believed this person was an inside man, someone who had been close enough to Rodrigo, who had not ridden his bike in over a month, to know that Rodrigo had chosen that morning to go for a bike ride down that service road. But it wouldn't be until investigators tracked down a small piece of paper with a faded signature on it that the so-called inside man would be revealed. Based on all the information investigators found, this is a reconstruction of what really happened to Rodrigo Rosenberg. On Friday, May 1st, 16 days after the murder of Musa and his daughter Marjorie, and nine days before Rodrigo's murder, the inside man, who would mastermind Rodrigo's assassination, contacted one of his most trusted lieutenants. He told him to go buy two prepaid mobile phones. He told the man to pay cash and warned him not to sign his name on any paperwork or sales receipt. The lieutenant did as he was told and dropped both phones along with the sales receipt off at the office of the inside man. By this point, the inside man had already arranged the hit on Rodrigo. He had reached out to two men who were actually close friends and relatives of Rodrigo, two powerful brothers who owned one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in Guatemala. The inside man had told them that he needed their help arranging a hit on a man he described as a, quote, extortionist. The brothers said they knew of a criminal gang that would probably do the hit for about $40,000. The three men settled the details. The brothers told the inside man that they would contact the hitman and arrange the payment along with the delivery of a burner phone that the hitman would use to communicate with the inside man. The inside man set the murder date for Sunday, May 10th and told the hitman that he would be in touch with them before that day with a detailed physical description of their target along with information on where and when they should actually commit the murder. Then, starting on Monday, May 4th, the inside man used the second prepaid cell phone to start calling Rodrigo's personal cell phone. He called Rodrigo at least once a day for the next five days, speaking only long enough to make a single threat, telling the lawyer to stop investigating the assassination of Musa Khalil. On May 9th, one day before Rodrigo's murder, the inside man called the hitman to tell them that Rodrigo would be on a bike and would be most vulnerable shortly after leaving his apartment when he turned onto a nearby service road. The next day, shortly before 8 a.m., the two hitmen sitting outside Rodrigo's apartment in the black Mazda with tinted windows heard their phone buzz. The driver took the call and turned on the speakerphone, and then they heard the sound of the inside man's voice. 
The shooter sat up and listened while he double-checked that his 9mm pistol was loaded. The voice on the phone was low and calm. Their target, he told them, was a tall, thin man dressed in navy shorts, a light blue top, and white sneakers. He would be leaving the apartment building at about 8.05 a.m. He'd be riding a red and white mountain bike. He told them to follow Rodrigo onto that service road and then ambush him there. He told them to approach Rodrigo from behind and shoot him in the back, and then once he was down, fire at least four more shots into Rodrigo's neck, up into his jaw, and a final shot into his forehead. The inside man told the hitmen to be sure they destroyed the cell phone he had given them, along with its SIM card, once the assassination was complete. The hitmen said they understood, and they hung up. At the same time, Rodrigo was standing in one of his bedrooms in his apartment looking out the window. And then a couple of seconds later, he turned around and went into the kitchen where he made sure his coffee maker was turned off. Then he collected his bike from the hallway. Pushing his bike next to him, he headed to the apartment elevator and punched the button for the ground floor where he exited the building. Once outside, Rodrigo made his way towards the main street, taking a few seconds to enjoy the cool temperatures and the sudden sunshine that was pouring through a break in the clouds. Then he queued up a song by Santana on his iPod, and despite feeling a little rusty and stiff, he hopped onto his bike, he turned right, and he began heading down the main street. After a few hundred yards, he turned onto the service road. When he saw the man in jeans and the dark jacket running towards him, he tensed up, but only for a second. Then he quickly turned his bike towards the side of the road where he jammed on his brakes, coming to a complete and sudden stop. Then he got off of his bike, dropping it onto the pavement in front of him, and then he sat down on the curb with his back to the man running toward him. A moment later, Rodrigo would have felt the first bullet hit him in the back. Before he could even absorb the punch or feel any pain, he felt the next four bullets hit. One in his cheek, one in his neck, one just below his jaw, and finally, with the killer standing right in front of him, another round into his forehead, knocking his upper body backward onto the grassy median. Seconds later, residents of the apartments in Zona 1 called the police. It would turn out the inside man, the person responsible for Rodrigo's assassination, was Rodrigo himself. He had been devastated by the assassination not only of his client, Musa, but of Musa's daughter, Marjorie. As Rodrigo had secretly told his son, Eduardo, and his friend, Luis, Rodrigo was deeply in love with Marjorie, and they were planning to get married as soon as Marjorie divorced her husband. The wedding ring that Rodrigo had been wearing at the time of his death, and when he was seen on camera in the YouTube murder video, had been a gift from Marjorie just before she was killed. The raw grief Rodrigo felt over the senseless killing of the woman he loved, along with his absolute conviction that the hit on Musa had been planned by a corrupt president, his wife, and personal secretary, had combined to create a feeling of total hopelessness in Rodrigo's head. At some point early in Rodrigo's investigation into Musa's assassination, Rodrigo realized that even if he could prove his allegations of corruption against the government, there was no way that anyone that high up in government would ever be charged or punished for their crimes. So early in May, Rodrigo, crushed by despair, came up with a plan that would both end his own personal misery and, he hoped, would set Guatemala on the road to real reform. It would be a suicide dressed up to look like an assassination. And with the video he planned to make before his death, Rodrigo hoped that his staged assassination would result in a bloodless coup that would take down the presidency of Alvaro Colom. So it was Rodrigo who had contacted his wife's cousins, the owners of the giant pharmaceutical company, and told them that he wanted to arrange a hit on an extortionist, a man, he told them, who had been after Rodrigo for money. His cousins had agreed, never once suspecting that the extortionist was actually Rodrigo himself. And the trusted lieutenant that Rodrigo had asked to go by the two prepaid cell phones, that was Rodrigo's trusted bodyguard slash driver. Rodrigo had made sure one of those two prepaid phones was delivered to the hitman, and he used the other phone to make threatening calls to his own personal cell phone and to give his killers his own personal description and to tell them exactly when and where they could find and kill him. And so on the morning of his own death, when Rodrigo saw the man in jeans and a jacket running toward him, he knew it was his killer. So he just pulled over, sat on the curb, and waited to be killed. 
As for the 18 minute long YouTube murder video, the insurance policy that guaranteed Rodrigo's allegations of corruption could not be swept under the rug, that was produced by Guatemala's top spy and Rodrigo's friend, Luis, with the help of one of Luis's contacts in Guatemala's right wing press. Although he eventually admitted his hand in making the video, Luis claimed he had no idea that Rodrigo was planning his own assassination. It is possible that Rodrigo's identity as the inside man might have gone undiscovered, except for the security footage that led investigators to the owner of that black Mazda, and the fact that Rodrigo's bodyguard made a critical mistake that linked the prepaid cell phones to his boss. When the bodyguard purchased those two burner phones, he did what Rodrigo said not to. He signed his name on one of the sales tax slips and submitted that slip of paper with his faded signature on it to a secretary at Rodrigo's law office. Even though Rodrigo's videotaped allegations of widespread government corruption were true and resulted in the CICIG removing hundreds of corrupt government officials from their jobs, it would turn out Musa Khalil's assassination and the unintended murder of his daughter Marjorie were not the work of Guatemalan government officials. Just as Guatemala's one honest lawyer was prepared to stage an assassination that could send his own cousins to prison, apparently the honest and incorruptible Musa was buying contraband from criminal networks for use in his textile factory. When Musa refused to pay those suppliers, they had him killed. Once Judge Castrosana released his findings and named Rodrigo as his own killer, the CICIG and government brought charges against Rodrigo's cousins, as well as the 10 members of the criminal gang that helped facilitate the hit. As for President Colom, the YouTube murder video scandal would end up actually strengthening his presidency. His decision to turn over the investigation into Rodrigo's death to a third party, the CICIG, and wait for their report, gave him the public appearance of being a calm and confident leader. In 1996, when Daniel was 24 years old, he became obsessed with this video game series called Ultima, which in the early days of PC gaming was this huge hit, it was this open world role-playing fantasy game. Daniel figured out where the creator of this game lived, and in the middle of the night, in the spring of that year, he went to this guy's house and he knocked on the door. And when the creator did not answer the door, Daniel's frustrated and he leaves, but comes back a couple hours later and proceeds to break a window, climb inside this guy's house, he goes upstairs, and he goes into one of the bedrooms where he crawls into one of the beds and falls asleep. The next morning when the creator got up, he finds Daniel laying in one of his beds and he starts yelling at him to get out of his house and Daniel's totally unfazed and he just wants to sleep in this bed. And so the guy calls the police, the police show up and Daniel's still in bed. And so they haul him out and they arrest him. A year later, Daniel would be arrested again for trespassing, this time in Orlando, Florida at SeaWorld, where Daniel had, after hours, snuck into the manatee exhibit and was swimming around with the manatees because apparently he wanted to play with them. But despite his criminal history, Daniel was far from a hardened criminal. In fact, many people that knew him described him as a very gentle, pot-smoking hippie who just adored animals. In 1999, when Daniel was 27, he joined a small religious community of people that practiced Hare Krishna, which is a branch of Hinduism. They get their name from their chant, Hare Krishna, that devotees repeat over and over and over again. During his stay with this community, Daniel basically blew off all of his responsibilities. He didn't really practice the religion. He didn't help out around the temple. Instead, he spent virtually all of his time feeding the wild birds that came to roost in of the temple's garden and he kept this notebook where he diligently tracked who had come into the garden which bird and how much he had fed them and what they looked like basically all he cared about were these birds after a month of living in the Hare Krishna community Daniel abruptly tells the other worshipers that he's going to be taking a vow of silence and this really confused the others because Hare Krishna does not encourage its members to take vows of silence this was something Daniel was just going to do on his own and so right before he took his vow of silence, he also informed them that he would be leaving. So he takes his vow of silence, he packs his stuff up, and he leaves. After departing, Daniel committed a series of petty offenses through South Carolina, Washington, Texas, and then ultimately in Florida. 
One of his offenses in Florida was stealing a candy bar at a 7-Eleven. And in court, because of his vow of silence that he was still living up to, he had to write on a piece of paper that he denied the charge. But ultimately, he was sent to jail for three days. After his stint in this Florida jail, Daniel gets out and he decides he wants to go back to Orlando, Florida and go to the SeaWorld where he had previously jumped into the manatee exhibit. And so he was going to go and presumably check out the manatees as well as some other animals. When he got to the park, he made his way over to the killer whale demonstration where some trainers were going to be swimming around in this enclosure with these massive killer whales. And witnesses said they remember seeing Daniel in the stands watching the show being just totally transfixed and open mouthed and fascinated with what he was looking at. But apparently Daniel's biggest reaction to any part in the show was when the trainers brought out Tilikum, the biggest killer whale ever held in captivity, measuring over 22 feet long and weighing over 12,000 pounds. Daniel was just totally taken with Tilikum. So that night after the park shut down and everyone went home, Daniel came back now wearing a bathing suit. He hops the fence and he sneaks back into SeaWorld the same way he did a couple years earlier when he snuck into the manatee exhibit. And somehow he managed to go through the park without being picked up on a camera and he makes his way over to the killer whale enclosure. He hops the fence, he takes off his shirt, takes off his shoes. So he's just got his bathing suit on and he jumps into the massive pool with Tilikum. When Daniel jumped into the manatee exhibit, he had said he just wanted to play with the manatees. And so it's assumed that when he jumped in with Tilikum, he just wanted to play with Tilikum. And apparently Tilikum was really eager to play with Daniel because Tilikum quickly played with Daniel by biting his shorts and bringing him to the bottom of the pool and dragging him along the bottom until Daniel drowned. And then after he drowned, Tilikum basically thrashed him around, throwing him up and down, ripping off pieces of him until finally he draped Daniel's body over his back and that's where Tilikum kept him. The next day when the staff showed up and made this discovery, they couldn't get Daniel's body away from Tilikum because Tilikum wanted to keep his toy. And so they had to use a special medical hoist to lift Tilikum up into the air to recover Daniel's body. Daniel's death was ruled an accident as a result of his poor decision-making. And so as such, Tilikum was not punished. In 1910, miners drilling inside of the Nika cave in Chihuahua, Mexico, punctured through the ground and discovered this flooded cavern. After pumping the water out and stepping inside of this cavern, they were amazed to see these massive gypsum crystals that had formed on the walls and the ceiling all over this cave. Although the crystals were beautiful, they were far less valuable than what these miners were after, which was silver. So instead of trying to, you know, mine out these crystals, they told the locals in the area that they had found this cave and that they really ought to come down here and protect it because it's this amazing natural wonder. And so for the next hundred years, the locals in Chihuahua, Mexico, basically kept this cave that they nicknamed the Cave of Swords under lock and key so that no one would go in there and destroy these amazing crystals. Fast forward to the year 2000 and two men are inside of this mine, not the Nika mine where the Cave of Swords is located, but a mine that was right up against it and they're drilling down and they're actually at the same level of where the Cave of Swords is located. And they don't know it yet, but they're drilling underneath the Cave of Swords. And they eventually puncture into the rock, revealing this underground flooded cavern. Now these two men are not tracking that this is right underneath the Cave of Swords. So they're not thinking there could be crystals inside of this flooded cavern. They're thinking there could be silver down there. So after pumping all the water out of this cavern, they crawl down inside and it opens up into this massive cavern with these enormous crystals coming out of the ceiling, the walls everywhere. And they are like 10 times, 15 times bigger than any of the biggest crystals inside of the Cave of Swords. These are literally the biggest crystals in the world. And this cavern looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. It's this unbelievable landscape. This new cave would be dubbed the Giant Crystal Cave. And like its counterpart, the Cave of Swords, it would be handed over to locals to protect. Now you'd think people would be lining up like crazy to get inside either of these two caves to see these natural wonders. But the truth is, nobody wants to go inside of these caves because they're death traps. Even though both of these caves have had the water drained out of them, their humidity level is still 100%, which means if you're in there too long in either of these two caves, 
you run the risk of your lungs starting to fill with water, effectively drowning you. In fact, scientists speculate that it would take about 10 minutes for this to happen to you if you were inside one of these caves, assuming you were not wearing a special breathing device that was pumping dry air back into you. But even if you were wearing these special air tanks, the cave would still kill you in about an hour because the temperature exceeds 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you combine the extreme heat with the humidity and the tight enclosed nature of an underground cave, you have a natural oven that if you stay in there too long, it will cook you alive. So the only people that go inside of these caves are researchers that wear all the special equipment and they only go inside for a couple of minutes at most. But in 2001, so one year after the discovery of the Big Crystal Cave, one of the workers who helped drain out the Big Crystal Cave decided, you know what, I want a crystal for myself. And so using his understanding of the mine and his access to this particular section of the mine, he made his way down and got inside of the big crystal cave. Now, the only special equipment he had was a saw because he figured he could get in there and saw off a piece of one of these crystals and get out of there in just a couple of minutes, certainly well before anything bad would happen to him. So he gets inside, he identifies the crystal he wants, and he starts sawing off the bottom of this crystal. But it dislodges a huge chunk of the crystal that falls on him. Now, when it fell on him, that didn't kill him but it pinned him inside of this cave. At this point, reality must have sunk in very quickly for this guy. He didn't tell anyone where he was going because what he was doing was illegal. And he knows that nobody checks inside of these caves to see if people are trapped or stuck because they don't expect people to go into these caves and they're off limits. A couple of days later, researchers went down into Big Crystal Cave and they discovered this guy still pinned underneath the big crystal he had cut from the ceiling. It was unclear whether he had died from drowning or from being cooked alive, but either way, he was deceased. To this day, Big Crystal Cave and the Cave of Swords are strictly off limits to the public. On June 30th, 2002, an 18-year-old named Daniel Dick was on vacation with his mother and his two younger brothers in Hawaii. Daniel had just graduated from his high school in Los Angeles, where he was the student body president. He was known to invite all of his classmates over to his house all the time for dinners, and girls would call him all the time to try to get advice about their boyfriends. And Daniel also would befriend troubled teens in an attempt to kind of pick them up and get them back on the straight and narrow. When he and his family left for this vacation, he had been working part-time at a grocery store and was getting ready to attend California State University in the fall. That morning, Daniel went down to the beach where he planned on doing some swimming and maybe laying out in the sun for a little bit. And pretty quickly, he met three girls. And after about 30 minutes of chatting with them, he asked them if they wanted to climb over the fence and check out the blowhole. A blowhole is a fairly narrow hole that is situated on rocks right near where water is crashing. And this hole is usually formed by molten lava that is passed through underneath. And what happens is this hole is connected to a tunnel that feeds down and out into the water. So when the waves come in, they go through this tunnel and they get rocketed up this little opening, causing a massive geyser of water. Now, if you don't go near the blowhole, it's not dangerous at all. It's just a very cool natural phenomenon. The beach that Daniel and these girls were on was situated right near an infamously dangerous blowhole called the Halona blowhole. The reason it was so dangerous is because the water it connected to through that tunnel was some of the most violent in all of Hawaii. So when those waves came barreling through the tunnel, it would shoot 30 plus feet in the air. And so to make sure everybody understood you're only allowed to watch the blowhole from a distance, they actually put up a fence all the way around it and put up signs saying, do not go any closer. To give you a sense of how powerful the water was that was churning through this tunnel, if you were standing on the other side of the fence, watching the blowhole from a safe distance, you could feel the ground shaking as the waves would rumble through the tunnel and then explode out of the blowhole. According to Daniel's family and friends, he was not a reckless person. He was just a very adventurous person. And so something like this blowhole really piqued his interest and he just couldn't handle being on the outside of the fence. He really wanted to get right up there and get a look at it. In fact, he told these girls he wanted to feel the power of the water hit him in the chest. That was his plan. 
The girls told him this was a bad idea, but he was insistent and he began walking over to the rocks where he could climb up and jump this fence. The girls went with him, but they stopped short of the fence. As Daniel made his way over to the rocks, he passed by a couple that was laying on the beach. He waved to them, he climbed up the rocks, he climbed over the fence, and he made his way over to the blowhole. And he timed it to where a wave had just come in and shot a geyser up. And then as soon as the water went down and there was a break, he walked over the edge of this hole that was not very far across. And he kind of arched himself over it so his chest was hovering right over where the water was going to come up. And initially a wave came through and the water shot up and it hit him in the chest and it kind of staggered him back for a minute. And at this point, the three girls and the couple that he had passed are now yelling for him to get away from the blowhole that it's way too dangerous. But it was too late. He leaned back over the blowhole right as a massive wave came barreling through the tunnel. It rocketed up and it lifted him off the ground about five feet in the air and it turned him upside down so his head is pointed down. And when he fell, he went directly into the blowhole. The couple and the three girls that saw this happen described his body position as being the perfect dive. And in order to actually get into the blowhole, you would need the perfect body position because the opening is very narrow and it goes down eight feet of just this narrow, narrow tube. And at the bottom of that, it opens up like the inside of a teapot. Then inside of there is this just vicious churning water that connects to this underground tunnel that feeds out to the sea. And so when Daniel went head first down, his momentum along with his perfect body position forced himself down through that hole into that section that's kind of like the inside of a teapot. And once you're inside, there's no way to go back up again. The opening is too tight and there's nothing to hold on to. You wouldn't have the ability to force yourself up through that hole again. So the only way out is through the underground tunnel that leads out to the sea. But there are constantly waves pounding their way up this tunnel into the section where Daniel had fallen into. And so realistically, anybody that tries to swim through this fairly long underground tunnel is only going to get so far before a wave forces them back or traps them in some way in this underground tunnel. As soon as Daniel went into the blowhole, the couple and the three girls immediately climbed up the rocks, hopped over the fence, and began looking into the tunnel, yelling for Daniel. And as they're sitting there yelling for him and yelling for people on the beach to call 911, they would feel the ground start to shake as another wave would come through the tunnel and erupt through the blowhole. And they know every time that happened, Daniel, if he was alive, he was completely submerged in water for 30 seconds or so every iteration that this blowhole erupted. By the time the police showed up, Daniel has been trapped inside of this blowhole for some time and no one's heard him, no one's seen him, and so it's starting to look pretty grim. And the police would say it's nearly impossible for anybody to survive being inside of this blowhole, especially at high tide, which is when he went in. In fact, the police would say, we can't even send divers in there until low tide, because if we send someone in now, they're gonna get killed inside of this blowhole. It's too violent inside of there. And so the best they could do was put a weighted line into the blowhole anchored on the outside, so that if by some miracle Daniel was still alive, he'd be able to grab this line and pull himself up. He probably would not be able to pull himself through the hole to safety but at least he could keep himself out of the water until rescuers could get there the next day at low tide. But when low tide came the next day and divers went out to the water, they discovered Daniel's body. It was floating near the area where water actually gets sucked into the tunnel and out through the blowhole. During low tide, he must have been pulled back out through the tunnel out to sea. It's unclear how long Daniel was alive once he landed inside of the blowhole or whether he ever attempted to actually swim through that tunnel out to sea but at some point he did drown. Daniel's mother petitioned to have a metal grate put over the blowhole so that nobody else would fall in and meet the same fate as her son. But this proposal was met with criticism from the locals who said the problem was not the blowhole, the problem was people not respecting the power of nature. And so while a fence still surrounds Holona blowhole telling people to stay back, the entrance to the blowhole is still uncovered. <laughs> 
So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and open their cereal. But when you open the bag, make sure you tear down the side of the bag, not along the intended seams at the top. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter, my username for both platforms.